A network analyzer has the ability to extend its reference plane away from the instrument itself. This ability to mathematically remove or cancel out the effective circuit between the analyzer and the reference plane is done with precise calibration loads and is the type of cal calculation I'm referring to. This is different from the calculation I did in a previous video where I compensated for RF wiring. The RF wiring compensation involved real components and resulted in phase shifts at all but a few frequencies. The VNA calculation also compensates for the circuit but cancels it out with no phase shift. This, is the, this cancellation is done mathematically by the VNA. However, this calculation can also be done graphically in SimSmith using non-real hence negative value components. Solving this, this graphical puzzle will tell us the actual circuit. Okay, this is a circuit I built oh, a few weeks ago and since I built it I knew the answer to the circuit so I kind of let it sit for a while. It contain I kind of know approximately what the circuit is but I don't know exactly what the circuit is. Pretend this is the network analyzer and we're going to put our precise loads out here and we're going to see what effect this circuit has on those and then we're going to try to guess the circuit from that. There's two pieces to this end block. One is the circuit that we're, there's unknown. The second one is a, is a function that does nothing more than change these loads when I change the values here. So for a zero here, I have a short at the output. If I make a one, put, set this value to one, I have effectively an open at the output. And if I set this value to two, I have a 50 ohm load. And I can just go back and, I can go back and forth easily. So let's look at the circuit for a minute. With a zero ohm load, here's the, here's the impedance we see at the generator. It's inductive at all frequencies. I'm sweeping from 100 kilohertz to 100 megahertz. And I've made this arbitrarily wide enough range that this represents a high frequency and this represents a very low frequency. Uh, so this is, it looks inductive at, uh, for when the, when the load is a short. If we make the load an open, it looks capacitive. And if we make the load be 50 ohms, we see this this trace. It starts off being a little capacitive and it, and it goes inductive, becomes inductive. So where might we start with this kind of a solution? Um, there's a lot of information contained here in these plots. Um, we just need to figure it out. If we look down here at the dot, the dot is the low frequency, the X is the, at the high end of the, of the uh, sweep range. At the low frequency, we see this looks like 5 ohms. That tells us that there's a DC resistance in this circuit of 5 ohms. So let's start with our guess at solving this circuit, at least having a 5 ohm, a minus 5 ohm resistor here. And then see what that does for us. Okay, well that does a lot for us. <clears throat> that means that DC, now this circuit kind of vanishes. A circuit that vanishes at DC means it can't have any series capacitors, it can't have any shunt inductors in it. And we appear to have fix the, the problem with the, uh, with the offset resistance. Let's look at it at an open. Well, at an open, it still looks very much like it did before. Five ohms in series with the circuit isn't going to be probably make much difference in an op with an open. And let's look at it 50 ohm, at, at 50 ohms. Well, we didn't, I didn't mention this before, but at 50 ohms before we started, let me move this component. You can see we started up at a 55 ohms, and then now we're back at 50. So the five ohm number looks to be a pretty good, pretty good guess here. So let's go back now to the short again. And it's inductive. So let's try to get rid of some of that inductance. So how do you get rid of inductance in a circuit, in a circuit that's, um, that's inductive? Well, we get rid of it by putting a negative inductance here. I have no idea what value. Let's try minus one microhenry. Oh, that's way too much, it looks like. Let's. Um, Start dropping this down. We went past it. Okay, somewhere down in here is probably pretty close. That's 57 or 58 micro, uh, nanohenries. <clears throat> now let's go back and look at the circuit with an open. It's still capacitive. It's capacitive 
but not at low frequencies. So that tells us there's a shunt capacitor somewhere involved. So let's put a shunt capacitor in the circuit here. And uh, it, would be a, it would be a negative value too. Everything's a negative value. Say 100 picofarads. Oh, that doesn't look good at all. Um, maybe it's too much capacitance. Maybe it's in the wrong place. Let's see what happens. Uh, that does not look good. Let's see if we move it to here. Um, it's not doing it either. Oh, this is looking good. Okay, now, now what we've got here is something that's going to cancel out our capacitance. It looks like it's doing a pretty good job, but it's not doing all of it. But this is pretty good. So now we've got a cancellation pretty well at for an open. Let's go back here and look at our short. Shorts look pretty good. And the 50 ohms look pretty good. Okay, this isn't a bad circuit. Let's see if we can make it a little bit better. So let's go back here to the low, to, a short, to the short side and zoom in and see what we got. Well, at low frequencies, we see is we see we have a very good zero ohm uh, impedance here. At high, as we go up in frequency, we start to see some resistance. That can be from a couple different things, but it's probably from the Q of the inductor. So let's take the Q of the inductor and drop it down some and see if that helps. Uh, it looks like it's helping some. It also means we don't have quite the right value of inductance either. So, and I'm doing this by moving the mouse wheel and I'm holding the shift and control keys down so I can control stuff. Uh, the inductance value needs to be, whoa, it's pretty sensitive to inductance, so that's pretty close. Well, that's very good, 58 nanohenries. And the Q now, seventy point one. Okay, that looks very, very good. Let's look at the circuit up here when it's open. Okay, now this tells us something else. The fact that we're we've got we're outside the Smith chart tells us that the capacitor's got a Q that's probably higher than what is displayed here. Let's see if that's really true or not. Um, 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 um. Okay, good, good. The capacitor's got some Q higher than that. I don't know how much it is. And it's the wrong value too, so let's, of capacitance. So let's change the capacitance ever so, s okay, we need another digit of accuracy here. Okay, back to the capacitance again. Let's. Whoa, that's good. 37 picofarads, a Q of 61,000. It probably means this Q was, was, it was just infinite. Um, maybe not infinite. It looks like it moves a little bit. I don't. I don't know what I. It may have been infinite. I can't remember if I what I did there. A hundred thousand maybe. That looks pretty close. Okay, what's it look like <clears throat> at 50 ohm point? Looks incredibly good. Okay, and then back to the short again, make sure we haven't changed anything there. That looks very good too. All right, so let's look at the circuit and see how we see how we did. If we take a look at this circuit, we see that the circuit is built with a 5 ohm resistor from W1 to a, a midpoint W3, a 58 nanohenry inductor with a Q of 70, from W3 to W2. So I have these two backwards, but again, that doesn't have any effect on a real circuit. Um, and it's built with a Q, oh, it's built with a capacitor of an infinite Q. Okay, so this Q was supposed to, should have been infinite then. Um, anyways, um, that's, it's kind of a puzzle, and you can learn a lot about circuits by watching what actually is happening. Now, you can figure out, I mean, this circuit was artificially easy to do. But if you have a, have a visual idea of what the circuit is, you can kind of guess at what's there, and then let some, some values be variables, and you can, you can get a very close match. The uh, little trick here to making the loads change uh, with the value here is a, a 
function. It's not too well known, I think, in SimSmith called select. But select takes a value called LD, which I'm, well, it takes any value, but it takes whatever the first parameter is here, LD. And if it's a 1, it returns this value. If it's a 2, it returns this, excuse me, if it's a 0, it returns this value. 0 or less than 0, it returns this value. If it's a 1, it returns this value. 2 or more, it returns this value. And you can have any number of parameters. So in the high end, you can go as far up as you want. In the low end, you can go as low, far down as you want. So if we go down here to 0 and we go below 0, we see we get the same value as if it was 0. We get a different value if it's 1. And here, 2. If it's above 2, it stays the same for everything. All, all values above 2. So that we, we use that to set the value of ohms in the load here and the... Uh, imaginary part of the um, impedance in the load is always set to zero. Anyways, that's kind of a fun, kind of a fun little example um, to do. I used to work at a place where we, we had these magic boxes. We tried to figure out what was inside of them as an exercise to, um, you know, it was, it was kind of a competition. And if you if you figured it out, you got dinner for two or something like that, which was which was a lot of fun. Uh, this represents not how an analyzer would really work because I contrived this circuit. So let's take this circuit and get rid of it and try a circuit that represents uh, reality. This circuit is a little bit trickier to look at. There are three files here. And the first file, if we look up here at the top, it'll tell you what the name of the file is. The file is, well, it, it prints it out on the side uh, over in, in the file chaser too. It's, uh, it was a little tin box I had that came at Christmas time with some candy in it that I put BNC connectors on both sides. It's got a piece of coax in it and the shield of the coax goes to one side of the connector, but the other end, it, it, it takes a little loop at the end to get back to the connector. So this is the, this is the coax to, to the, I mean, I called it coax shield to chassis. Um, this is with a short on the far end of the circuit, an open and 50 ohm load, kind of similar to what most network analyzers do. So this file right here represents a short. Let's look at this. This file here represents an open, and this file here represents a 50 ohm load. So, though, and I measured these with the network analyzer. My network analyzer um, produces a file. SimSmith re reads the file in. That is the actual file right there that it reads. It's the CSV file. If we look at the file, um, <clears throat> like, let me go, go, grab the file real fast here if I can find it. Um, I'm doing this on a different monitor. I'll bring it over just a second. Okay. This is the file that came out of my network analyzer. It was, little, it was an AIM-4170. SimSmith recognizes, ignores all this stuff. It recognizes this line 5. It, tr it takes this value, which is the frequency, skips this, takes this value, which is the resistance, this value, which is the, which is the reactance, skips those values, and does it for all frequencies involved. Uh, SimSmith has quite a few... Um, input filters which allow you to um, take most, well not most, but a lot of different uh, device outputs and uh, use those as inputs for SimSmith. And if you have a device that doesn't, uh, isn't supported by SimSmith, Ward's been uh, very good at uh, adding those very quickly. So this is what we got for a circuit here now. So we know what the guest circuit, so I'm gonna, I made a control block here to control all of these three circuits. They're all gonna work at the same time against these three different loads, and we're gonna try to make every one of these be, be a dot here, here, and here. And to avoid having to, con to adjust all three of those at the same time, I built a control circuit. The control circuit's pretty simple. Um, it's got a zero ohm resistor from port one to port two. The reason it has to have that in there, I cannot, I cannot put a, I cannot label the two ports identically. If I do that, it says you can't port, connect the two ports together. So um, we fool it by putting just the zero arm resistor there. Effectively, the circuit does nothing. And there's four lines of, of importance here. The first one is we say in component D, the length field right there is set to the same thing as it is in component E, the same it is as it is in component F, and it's equal to the length component right here. So if I take this component right here and I move it up and down, you'll see all these three move at the same time. And they do. So with that being the case on all these variables, I can make the, all these change at the same time. 
So what circuit did I use here? Well, I knew it was a piece of transmission line coming in. Uh, it had a length. I don't know exactly what the length was. It's a 50 ohm piece of Teflon transmission line. So it's 50 ohm impedance, 0.695 velocity factor. It's small diameter coax. So I think it's about 0.7 dB per uh, 100 feet at 10 megahertz. And wiring generally, um, I've been doing this for a long time, but small amount of wiring is almost always best modeled with a small inductor, a small inductor, and a small capacitor to ground. So that's the circuit I put in there. So let's see what we can do in this circuit. And, and this is um, this is trial and error to do, but it's actually pretty easy to do. It's it, and you get you get pretty good at it uh, in a hurry. So as we change the length of our transmission line, notice what we're seeing here. We're seeing a lot of changes, um, and we're and I can go back and I can look at my transmission line. I can say to myself, I know it's about 0.33 feet um, for measurement, so I'll put that in as a starting point. Let's uh, we we can see it. We can still see that it's still inductive, so we need more inductance. You can see how how the, um, the this this side moves a lot faster than this side, and that may be too much inductance. I don't, I don't really know. Um, it it I don't know. It's the other side. Now. What we're seeing is just the, two, the sum of the two inductances, but what the two inductances are doing, they're placing the capacitor at, very, at various places based on the ratio of the two of those. So let's see. Um, the capacitor will affect this value over here the most. So let's move the capacitance up till we get pretty close. That's pretty close. The inductance over here is not too bad. Let's see. We need more inductance, it looks like. More inductance. Do we need it on the top or the bottom? It's hard to say. That's, this is looking pretty good. So let's go over here and zoom in. Okay, it doesn't look quite as good as it looked before. Um, of course, that's the way everything is. When you get close, it doesn't look as good as it did. This, this doesn't have hardly any effect at all on it. So this is the one that has the effect. I don't know. That's pretty. That's really actually pretty close. Uh, the, the inductance has very little value, very little effect. The capacitance has more, and we need to get the capacitance a little bit. That's uh, pretty close. So 3.7 picofarads for the capacitance. Over here for the inductance. Oh, this inductance, obviously, since it's moved in, has a Q. I didn't ac accommodate the Q here. Um, this is still pretty close. If we look at this, you know, from from far away, that that looks pretty good. That tells us what the circuit actually is. The circuit looks like 0.33 uh, feet of transmission line, 20 nanofarad capacitor, 3.7 picofarad to ground, and a 7.5 nanofarad capacitor or inductor. Um, and we could, you know, we can't build that circuit because these are negative value components. But it tells us what this, what the circuit actually is, uh, inside. So, um, you know, that's kind of a, it's interesting. I, it's not real useful because it it creates a, a, a circuit that you can't build. But it does tell you what what a circuit is. And if you and if you were to build something and do this test, um, and make SimSmith act like a network analyzer, you can figure out the circuit. If you don't do if you did it just at one load impedance, you could balance it out at one at one for one impedance. Uh, uh, you could get it to match at one impedance, but that wouldn't be over all frequencies and wouldn't be over all impedances. This actually gives you a match over all frequencies and all impedances. I mean, it matched all the way from uh, one to 100 megahertz pretty well at um, with an open on the output of it or short on the output of it. It matched very well from one to 100 megahertz with a 50 ohm load on the output. It matched very well from 1 to 100 megahertz with a open on the output. And that's exactly what a network analyzer does when you calibrate it. So anyways, hope I hope you found this video interesting. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things you can do with SimSmith. And there's a lot of power in SimSmith too that uh, I don't know how you get the information out to everybody um, other than by doing examples because uh, some of this stuff uh, w is probably not easily discoverable unless you get a little hint to go, uh, you know, to get going. 
Uh, I learned this stuff a oh, long, long time ago with some people who um, knew this stuff very, very well, and I always thought it was interesting and kind of picked up some stuff from them. But anyways, hope these videos help.